Mark 13, if you found it, I invite you to stand with me and let's read together God's Word. Mark 13, a most difficult chapter. It's arguably the most confusing, debated chapter in all of Mark's Gospel. It begins as Jesus is leaving the temple. He's got a few of his smallest coterie of disciples, Peter, James, and John, who noticed Jesus said something that shocked him. As they were leaving and they looked up at that beautiful edifice, that matchless building called the temple, Jesus said, those stones are going to be torn down. And they couldn't believe it because the building had just been finished by Herod nearly. And so they asked him, what do you mean by this? When's this going to happen? And, and by the way, you're the Messiah, right? When's all this going to end? When are you going to bring all this to a conclusion and start reigning as our king? Jesus answers in, Matthew thir- in Mark 13. Verses 5 through 23, which we've studied the last two weeks, he basically summarizes it as follows. Things are going to get worse before they get better. But praise be to God, in our text today, beginning in verse 24, we are going to see that the bad news doesn't get the last word. Jesus is coming again. Notice, if you will, his words found in Mark 13, beginning in verse 24. Jesus says, But in those days, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and and glory. And then he'll send out the angels, and he'll gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Would you join me as we pray? Let's ask God to help us make sense of this glorious passage. Father in heaven, I'm asking that you would come and open our eyes to behold wonderful things from your word. Spirit, move so that Jesus Christ, our Lord, will receive the glory and honor that is fitting, that is due his name. And I pray this in that name, Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Perhaps the cardinal claim of Christianity is that Jesus is coming again. I just want those simple words to roll around in your mind and heart for a moment. Jesus is coming again. Again, let it weigh on you anew that he who came is coming again. That he who came as an infant will one day come as the infinite. That he who came to be mocked will one day come to be magnified. That he who came to serve will one day come as sovereign. That he who came to be executed, will one day come to be exalted. Just think of it, that he who came wrapped in clothes of humility will one day come as he who will be robed in majesty. He who came to be judged will one day come to judge. He who came to seek and save is one day coming to rule and reign. He who came crowned with a crown of thorns, praise God, is one day coming with a crown of glory. Jesus is coming Again, and this is the hope of all history. And lest you think that is an overwrought, overstated claim, just consider with me that in truth, the second coming of Jesus could be argued to be the hope of the Old Testament. You might be surprised to realize that within the 39 books of the Old Testament, you will find some 1,845 or so predictions, prophecies of that great second coming of Christ. It's often referred to as the great coming day of the Lord. 
Shouldn't surprise you then that if it is the hope of the Old Testament, it is also the hope of the New Testament. You'll find well over 300 more clear predictions, prophecies, references to that great second coming of the Lord. It's often referred to in the New Testament as the parousia, which is a word that means the appearing of Christ. He is going to come back and we are going to see him. Paul calls it that blessed hope that we are all waiting for. That's why throughout the history of the church, this same hope of the Old Testament and this same hope of the New Testament has tended to be the hope of the Christian church throughout the ages. Think of it in generations gone by when Christianity was outlawed in many segments of the world, as by the way it still is today, there was a password for the persecuted often bantered about to identify one another as believers. It became a watchword of sorts for those who were followers of the way and the truth and the life. And do you want to know what that watchword, that password was? It was the Aramaic Maranatha, which means, come, Lord Jesus, come. It has been the hope of the church, which is why, folks, take heart. His second coming is the hope of this church. Jesus' return is why we sing and why we pray, why we hope and why we obey. Folks, there, it is why we can, no matter what comes our way, say that, well, we're going to be okay because there is one who is going to come and right every wrong, one who is going to come and wipe away every tear from our eye. Folks, Jesus is coming Again, and I wonder, is the hope of the Old Testament, the hope of the New Testament, the hope of the Christian church and the hope of this church, is it your hope today? It's often been said that some people can be so heavenly minded that they're of no earthly good. And while I think I understand the sentiment, I'm actually inclined to think that we're more likely to be accused of the opposite. We're so earthly minded that we're of no heavenly good. I think Jesus wants us from this text to fix our minds on that coming day. In fact, I want you to feel this. I believe in verses 24 through 27 that the call of Christ is for you and for me to set our minds this day on that coming day. And verses 24 through 27 are going to help us do just that. But before I go any further, I must say as a critical caveat, there are some who will disagree with everything I'm about to say. I I suspect few to none in this room, but there are some scholars out there that are inclined to think that this passage is not referring to the second coming. Some will read those opening words in verse 24 that say, well, I mean, just look there. It says, but in those days after the tribulation. And they'll read that and say, okay, well, in those days, well, those days must be referring to what just happened, and what just happened was describing that abomination of desolation. It's describing the temple being destroyed in 70 AD. Okay, well, this can't be talking about the second coming. Here's what it means. When the sun and the moon and the stars went dark, that was when it went dark at the crucifixion. And when the Son of Man appeared in glory in the clouds, that was Jesus ascending to the Father after the resurrection. And when the angels were sent out gathering the elect, that's basically messengers, like gospel preachers going out and sharing the gospel to all the known world. And while I understand that's a pretty innovative way to read this, I just candidly think it's wrong. I think verses 24 and 27, and I hope to seal this argument to your heart today, I believe without qualification that this is a reference to that great second coming of Christ, that coming day of the Lord. And if you're still hung up with, then why would he say, but in those days... I want you to consider with me that prophets tended to talk this way. They tended to use language that would make you think that something's way sooner than it ends up actually being. How many times does Jesus say, I am coming quickly? And it's been 2,000 years since that occurred. There is very clearly a prophetic way of speaking that, well, for lack of a better, let me describe it with an experience I had last week. Last week, I went with Clint to the Grand Canyon. And as I stood at the South Rim... And my task was to go down and across and up to the north rim. The truth is, with my inept eye, I looked across and I thought, man, that's not that far. Maybe like five miles or so. Because you can see the north rim. Little did I know, seven miles down. Only then do you get to the river. Seven miles across the floor of the canyon before you even start going back up. 
and then seven miles back up. Folks, it was 21 grueling, painstaking miles. By the way, I did it a lot faster than the pastor. You be sure he knows that. (laughs) You're standing on that south rim. It sure looks a lot closer than it is. You get down in it and you actually realize what appeared close is much further away. I think that's what's happening here. The prophet is speaking in this telescopic way where he's saying something is about to happen, but it's in the way that Jesus often speaks, that what is soon to come will come on the last days. It's not just any old days, it's the last days. In other words, verses 24 through 27, I think, are illustrating for us the last chapter of redemption story. I think these verses are describing for us the great loud crescendo of redemption song. I think these verses are picturing for us that great final act of redemption's drama. These verses are underscoring for you and for me that the return of Christ really is the hope of all history, and here's why. I believe Jesus is making crystal clear to you and to me that his return Christ's return will be the climax of history. Now, I want each one of those words I said to just roll around in your mind for a moment. His return will be the climax of history. And lest, again, that sound a little overstated, just consider with me all the climactic events of world history and how they're going to differ from this one. In a very real sense, every significant event you could ever detail in world history was limited in one way, shape, or form, typically by who knew about it, who saw it, and who experienced it, felt it. So for example, let's take the greatest of all wars, the famed infamous World War II, seemed to touch every corner of the globe. The truth of the matter is, while it was widespread, there were people that didn't know about it. There were surely peoples in certain countries uninvolved with the war without any access to technology that would have informed them. They were blissfully unaware. Or consider, for example, that pivotal event of our generation, the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Even with the advent of television that made it possible for people around the world to witness it on TV, the truth is even to this day there are a great many people without access to the internet or television who never saw what our eyes so painfully saw that Tuesday morning so many years ago. Or just consider the biggest event of recent history, the COVID-19 pandemic that swept the world just a few years ago. The truth is, though, most of us in this room felt it one way, shape, or form. It's actually documented that many didn't. Either they were never infected, they never really got sick, nobody in their family was ever uh, hit by this plague. The truth is, every significant event in world history limited one way, shape, or form, but not so with the coming of Christ. I want you to see that this great day of the Lord that awaits us, it is going to be an unprecedented day. There will not be anybody left unaware. All will know what's happening that day. This is going to be an unequaled day. This is going to be a day where none will be left unimpressed. Everybody that day is going to see what's transpiring. This great coming day of the Lord, it is going to be a day that is unparalleled. Nobody is going to be left, folks, absolutely nobody will be left unaffected on this great final glorious day of the Lord. Everybody is going to feel it one way, shape, or form. Jesus is, in other words, illustrating for us in this text three ways, in my judgment, why the coming day of the Lord, Christ's return, why it will be the climax of history. And let's just take his word for it. Let's notice how he begins to describe this great coming day of the Lord in the latter half of verse 24. Which, by the way, how would you seek to put into words the otherwise indescribable? How do you do that? You ever found it hard to describe something? It's like words elude you and you're not sure what to say? Politicians often try to take language that people would be familiar with and put it in their arsenal when they speak to help people feel the weight of what they're saying. So for example, Winston Churchill was famed for being a master of the English language. It was famously remarked of Churchill that he mobilized the English language and he sent it into battle. And that is similarly what Jesus is doing in verse 24. When you read these weird words about the sun and the moon and the stars and the heavens, you're thinking, what is happening here? What Jesus is clearly doing to these folks, it's not as clear to us, 
the original audience would have immediately recognized these words were allusions, citations, references to Old Testament prophecies. Jesus is, in other words, taking the prophets of old, and he is, like Winston Churchill of old, mobilizing them and sending them into battle to help them feel, to see, sense, savor just how great and glorious this coming day of the Lord will be. So, for example, he takes uh, into account the words of Isaiah, that famed prophet of old. And in Isaiah uh, chapter 13 and verse 10, he cites Isaiah who says, on that day of the Lord, the stars and the constellations are not going to give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will give no light. He brings in the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 32 and verse 7 and adds his voice to the mix when he writes, the heavens will be covered. He'll make the stars dark. He's going to cover the, sky, the sun with a cloud, and the moon is going to give no light on this coming day of the Lord. And then he most famously takes the prophecy of Joel. Joel mentions this many times. I'll give you just one reference. Joel 2 and verse 10, Joel remarks that there will be the earth quaking on that day. The heavens are going to tremble on that day. The sun and the moon are going to be darkened on that day. The stars are going to withdraw on that day. And here's the question. What does Jesus mean by all of this? Should we take his words literally or figuratively? Now, I don't mean take them as true or not true. I mean, should, were they intended to be something that is plainly going to happen? Like literally the sun and moon and stars and whatnot are going to go dark and go crazy? Or is this more of a poetic thing? Let me help you think through the two possibilities. So he could mean this literally. Perhaps Jesus is plainly saying that everything in creation is going to start imploding. Which there's warrant for this. Because consider for the example, the Bible says that Jesus Christ upholds the universe by the word of his power. It is, in other words, his upholding hand that keeps all the laws of physics together. And perhaps on this coming day, he's going to let it loose. And he is going to basically begin his, crea his recreative work. And the Bible says he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Perhaps this is the beginning. And you're going to literally start seeing all of this implode. I think that could be the case. Perhaps Jesus is making a grand appearance. Have you ever been to a show where when the person comes out to speak, they turn out all the lights before he comes out to get your attention, and then the lights come on, and ta-da, he's there? Perhaps that's what Jesus is doing. He's making a grand appearance. He's, he's turning out all the lights before he comes. But perhaps you should conversely take it more poetically. After all, Jesus does appear to be citing a bunch of apocalyptic prophetic writers of the Old Testament who said all this about things happening in their day that didn't actually happen. So, so maybe that's how we should take it. So it's not necessarily referring to his upholding hand that he's going to let everything loose. Maybe in a more figurative way, it's referring to his restraining hand. Think about this with me. God's hand is on this world such that we haven't all killed each other. Have you ever thought, especially if you are old enough to have lived through the advent of the nuclear age, and you're wondering all it takes is one megalomaniac to end everything, who has the executive authority to launch nuclear weapons, and you're wondering how are we still here? It's because there is the restraining hand of God that is willed that we be here. Our lives are in his very hands. He is what's kept this world together. Perhaps he's going to let that restraining hand loose and figuratively speaking, poetically speaking, the sun and the moon and the stars are going to come crashing and everything is going to feel like it's falling apart. Like Harry Truman, uh, our president of old, when he famously entered the White House right after Franklin Delano Roosevelt suddenly died, he is reported to have said right after he put his hand on the Bible and made the oath of office, I feel like the sun and the moon and the stars have fallen on my shoulders. He didn't mean that literally. He meant it poetically. Perhaps that's what Jesus is referring to. Here, here's the truth. I think you can go either way. When in doubt, and I'm in doubt, I always err on the side of the plain reading. If I don't really know what it means, I'm just going to give the, reader, the writer the benefit of the doubt and assume that this could literally be happening. And I think it could literally happen. But whether it's literal or whether it's figurative, guess what, folks? There's one thing that will not change. Nobody on that day is going to be left unaware. There is coming a day where all of our eyes are going to be open and we are going to know that this is the day of the Lord. That means, folks, there's coming a day when every skeptic 
on this earth will finally confess that there is a sovereign. There is coming a day when every single critic on this earth will finally admit that there is a creator. There is coming a day when every atheist will confess that there is an almighty. There is coming a day, folks, do you realize this? There is really coming a day when every scientific materialist who thinks this world is just happening by physical processes, even they will admit on that day that there is a maker. There is coming a day when none will be left unaware this great glorious day of the Lord when the sun and the moon and the stars will be darkened and the earth itself will feel as if it's convulsing. Now, is that it? Where's the good news? Because that doesn't sound too good so far. Praise God that there is verse 26, which says, and then. And what? What's going to happen next? And then they will see him. Who is going to see what? Let's consider, for example, who is the they that's going to see this person? The they, almost everybody agrees, is every man, woman, and child in all God's creation. From every tribe, tongue, and nation. All peoples over all the world in that day will see him. And just consider with me what that actually means. That means there is coming a day when everybody will finally see Jesus for who he is. Every Muslim will one day confess that Jesus is more than just a holy prophet, that he is the holy God himself. There is coming a day when every Hindu will believe, will admit, will see with their own two eyes that Jesus is more than just a God, one in 300 million. He is the one true and living God. There is coming a day, do you realize this, when Every single practicing Jew will see with their own two eyes that Jesus is more than just a buried son of Joseph. He is the risen son of God himself. There's coming a day when every Buddhist will see with their own two eyes that Jesus is more than just a wise and enlightened man. He is the all-wise God himself. There is coming a day, in other words, when every unbeliever in Jesus Christ throughout all the world will one day finally see that Jesus is more than just a man. He is the God-man. He is the Lord. Folks, there is coming a day when everybody will see him. And what are we going to behold on that day? What will we see? Well, just look down at the verse with me. Notice it says, on that day we will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. What do these words describe for us? I want to pick them apart one by one and help you picture with your mind's eye what we and all people everywhere will behold on that great glorious and final day. There is coming a day when we are going to see Jesus appear as the Son of Man, which is one of Jesus' favorite self-designations. He borrows it from Daniel. He refers to himself as such many times in the Gospels. And it's a beautiful, picturesque way of describing that Jesus is going to come back physically, bodily, visibly, as a man. Do you realize Jesus is alive bodily this moment? He was raised from the dead, and he is living as a ruling, reigning king of the universe in a body. And we are going to see him visibly and bodily one day return. In other words, what we are going to behold is we are going to behold the great hope of Christianity. We who throughout all of our lives have said, he is risen, he is risen indeed, we'll one day finally see with our own two eyes, he is risen indeed. We're going to see him as truly man, but he is no mere man. He is the God man, which is why the next phrase says, he, the son of man, is going to come in the clouds. What is that referring to? That phraseology, coming in the clouds, is candidly, it's a reference to the way God likes to ride. It's his mode of transportation. If you read the Bible, you will discover that God tends to show up in the clouds. Every time it, he shows up, other than in the person and work of Jesus, it seems that he manifests himself in a holy cloud. Think of the Shekinah glory cloud of the Old Testament as an example. The psalm actually tells us, one of the psalmists tells us, 
that Jesus makes the clouds his chariots. This is, in other words, underscoring for us that when this Son of Man comes on the clouds, he who is risen will also come as he who is reigning. What we are going to see with our own two eyes is one who is not merely truly man. We're going to see one who is truly God in that moment. He'll be truly God, truly man. But there's a third thing that he wants us to note. And notice that it says he's going to come with great power and glory, which I think fulfills the trifecta of his glory. It's going to show us that he who is coming as truly God and he who is coming as truly man is he who is coming as truly Lord. He who is risen and he who is reigning is he who is coming to rule. He is going to come with omnipotent, unlimited, unmitigated power. He will not be stopped. His hand will not be shortened. He will come and accomplish all of his good purposes and he will do so in a most glorious, indescribable sense. Oh, folks, do you realize that The return of Christ will be the climax of history, not only because on that day none will be left unaware. It's because in truth on that day, secondly, none are going to be left unimpressed. Every man, woman, and child will look up awed, shocked, and amazed. And I wonder how many of you are cynically thinking, not me. I didn't want to be here. My mother drug me here. And the truth of the matter is I yawn at the name of Jesus. And if that's you, I'm... I mean this in the most tender, sincere, pastoral way I know how to muster. I I plead you would lend me your ear. Beware. Because there is coming a day when your yawn will turn into a gasp. Your mouth will fall open. And you will be dumbstruck, awed and amazed when you behold with your own two eyes this coming Son of Man in the clouds. If you shrug your shoulders at the Lord and think this is a bunch of hogwash, Oh, I plead that you would heed this warning that there is coming a day when your shrugged shoulders will stoop so low that you'll want to melt into the very pavement before the fire of His glory and holy grace. Folks, if you you just think that this is a little ridiculous, I pray, I pray that you would recognize that rolling your eyes at the Lord, there's going to come a day when those rolled eyes will be fixated on Him. And you're not going to be able to look away. But I recognize in a room like this, the majority of us can't wait for that day. You're longing for that day. And if that's you, I recognize how hard it is to wait, which is my pastoral word to you is remember. One of the reasons why his second coming is our great hope of history is because even though today we walk by faith and not by sight, folks, there is coming a day when your faith is going to be vindicated. Your faith will become sight. You're going to see him. And at last, All of your living by faith will be vindicated and you will behold face to face He who is risen, reigning, and ruling, the Son of Man coming on the clouds with great power and glory. On that day, nobody is going to be left unimpressed. But why is Jesus coming back? Why is He? Is He just coming to make a grand ta-da appearance? He turned out the lights, he turned it back on with his great glory, everybody looks at him and then he just leaves the stage. Why is he coming back? Verse 27 gives us a most succinct summary to understand the reason for his return. And in verse 27, just note with me, it says, on that day, he is going to send some angels to gather his elect from every corner of the world. What does he mean by this strange phrase? Well, let's pick it apart piece by piece. On the one hand, we shouldn't be surprised that angels are involved here because, candidly, the Lord tends to use angels, his choice messengers, to do his will. He sends angels to proclaim his message. He sends angels to provide for his people. He sends angels in the Bible time and again to protect his people. Just consider how he sent angels to Abraham, how he sent angels to several other prophets like Gideon of old, how he sent angels to Mary, to Zechariah, how he is surrounded by a great multitude of the angelic hosts at the end of times, how he was ministered to by angels in his temptation in the wilderness. It shouldn't surprise us that if Jesus has a task that needs to be accomplished, he's going to send his angels to accomplish it. And what is this task? It says they are being sent, commissioned to gather his elect. Now you got to remember that the word elect is a common word used in the Bible to describe his own believers, his sheep, those who know his name, those who hear his voice. It's for Christians. It's people that follow the Lord. 
And the great glorious news of this text is that there is coming a day when Jesus is going to gather us to himself. He's coming for you. He's coming for you. And notice how he's coming for you. He's coming and he's going to find you from all the four corners of the world. It says all the four winds, which is a poetic way of saying you will not be hidden from him. He will not leave any of his own behind. If you are forlorn as a believer, if you feel forsaken as a believer, if you feel forgotten as a believer, if you are lonely and isolated, and if you're wondering if you're real, if you're wondering you haven't done enough, if you are in Christ, you are his. None will slip out of his grip. He will find you. He will take you home. Folks, you will not be left behind. This is a great, glorious, good news for Christians, that there is coming a day when he is going to find and save each of us, rescue us, bring us to himself. But before I seal this glorious truth to your heart in conclusion, I wonder how many of you are thinking, wait a minute, preacher. I'm confused because I thought that Jesus was going to come gather all of us before all the tribulation and all this bad stuff that was going to happen. This is confusing because it kind of feels like after. By the way, there are two views on this. There's actually more than two, but there's two predominant views. There's the most common view, it's a view that I've taught all my life, is that Jesus is going to come and gather us, rescue us before all this happens. It's often called the pre-tribulational view. There's another view that's called the post-tribulational view that says, no, we're going to suffer through this with everybody else, and then he's going to get us. So then how do you make sense of this text? Because this text kind of seems like the latter, right? Well, some will read this text and say, okay, well, what this is actually referring to is Jesus is going to gather those people who place their faith in Christ in the millennial reign of Christ. So those Christians that become Christians after God snatches all the Christians in his first coming, what is often described as the rapture. And I think that's a valid view that a lot of people hold. There's, a, there's another view that says, no, this text amongst others would clearly illustrate that there's going to be one second coming where Jesus is going to come back for all of us at one time. And here's the truth. I'm just going to straight plagiarize our pastor from last week. I think the way to make sense of this is let's just put it this way. Folks, how about you and I pray that it's going to be a pre-tribulational rapture and be prepared for a post-tribulational rapture? I don't know how this is going to happen. It's not altogether clear. Genuine, godly, Bible-believing, conservative folks have been on either side of this. But however it's going to shake out, there is one thing that is certain. No matter how you view it, we can all conclude that on this day, not only will none be left unaware, not only will none be left unimpressed, on that great glorious final day, thirdly and finally, I want you to feel with me that nobody, is going to be left unaffected on that day. Nobody. There's a critical phrase that the Apostle Matthew records that Mark, for some reason, leaves out. When Matthew records this teaching of Jesus, he includes in Matthew 24 and verse 30, you might want to mark that in your margin, that on that day, when he's gathering his elect, he records that all the nations are going to mourn which I think graphically illustrates for you and for me that for those who do not know Christ, and I trust in a room this size there are a great many, that you need to hear that there is coming a day that is going to be a day of judgment for you. This is going to be a day of mourning. This is the day that Jesus so memorably describes in Matthew 25 as the day when he will separate the sheep from the goats when he will separate believers from unbelievers, the wheat from the chaff. Folks, there is coming a day of just judgment. Unless that sound like a burden too heavy to bear, unless it sound like there's heartless condemnation coming towards you from this pulpit, oh, I pray you lend me your ear this one final moment. There is good news for you. Evidently, as it stands, that coming day is not today, at least yet. And so my word to you is, with Jesus, the writer of Hebrews, and the psalmist of old, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. If you are hearing the call of Christ this hour, and you know that you know that this great glorious coming day of the Lord is going to be a day of judgment for you, 
You can this hour simply confess that he really is who he says he is. That he is the one who came to live the life you could never live and died the death that you deserve. He is, as the writer describes, as he who is risen, reigning, resurrected, ruling as our king. He is the son of man who is going to come again on the clouds with great power and glory coming for his own. And folks, if you but by faith say, I believe you are who you say you are, I trust you done what you've said you've done, then the precious promise of God's holy word is that you will be mightily, miraculously saved. And here's the great glorious news for you. That coming day of judgment will become for you a glorious, indescribable day of joy. There is, in other words, for Christians, coming a day that will be an indescribable day of joy. When my little girl... Eliza first started to read. My wife and I bought her a little um, hymnal for kids, and we started singing a hymn to her every night. And her favorite hymn that she wants to sing all the time, in fact, we sang it last night with her. It, well, I gotta tell you, before I tell you the name, the reason she loves this hymn is not for good theological reasons. It's because it was written by a lady named Eliza. So she liked the hymn written by a lady with her name. But it's one I think you know. How many of you know and love that old favorite, When We All Get to Heaven? I'm going to spare you the singing, even though I've been dared to do it about a hundred times since the eight o'clock service. Just consider with me anew those wonderful lyrics of its refrain, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, and we're going to see him, folks, the song says we're going to sing and shout the victory, which is why this side of eternity, we must heed the call of Christ and set our minds today on that coming day. The famed reformer Martin Luther once remarked that he has but two days written in his calendar. Today and that day. And I pray that God would so move in my heart and yours, in the very soul of this church, that we would in one accord Live until he calls us home by this one glorious watchword. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come. Would you join me as we pray? And as we pray, may I just speak a brief word to you. If you know that you are outside of Christ and that this coming day of the Lord is a coming day of judgment, hear yet again, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. There is the free gift of grace, as Alex read to us in the prayer time, that is offered you. The wages of your sin is indeed death, but the free gift of God is eternal life, and it only comes through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so believe him and receive that grace. And join me, we, and all creation who are longing for that great and glorious day that will be not a day of judgment, but a day of joy when we will at last see our maker, our risen, resurrected, reigning and ruling king at last. Oh, I pray that God would so move in your heart that by faith and with full integrity, you could pray with me, come, Lord Jesus, come. Father in heaven, would you by the power of your spirit so move in this room that my mere feeble and eloquent words would pierce the hearts of your people, that your word, in other words, would do its work, that you would open our eyes anew to behold the wonderful weight of this word, and that we would live in light of eternity, in light of that great climactic glorious day when none will be left unaware, none will be left unimpressed, None will be left unaffected. Come, Lord Jesus, come, we pray in Jesus' name.